Welcome back. Bonsoir to the Knights of Columbus 142nd Supreme Convention here in Quebec City. I'm Matthew Bunsen, joined by Jonathan Reyes, the Senior Vice President for Strategic Partnerships. Welcome. It's good to be with you, Matthew, and a lot going on behind a us. A lot is going on. As you can hear and see, uh, the steaks dinner, and we'll talk more about that in a second, is about to get underway. So all of the participants, uh, the participants here in this remarkable convention are now going in for the state's dinner. Yeah, it's it's probably obvious the state's dinner is a party. Yes. It's a bit of a celebration. It's been a good day, beautiful mass, a business meeting, which is largely the report. It's a time to actually spend time now together. You're bringing people from all over the world. They don't get to spend time together, the leaders. And so this is their chance to have an evening together, enjoy one another's company but also to hear from His Eminence Cardinal O'Malley. Right. So that'll be the, that'll be the key thing tonight uh, to pay attention to. And as always, His Eminence is, always has something important to say. He does. And, and today we had the opportunity to talk to him, coming on the heels of the news that uh, his resignation had been accepted uh, by Pope Francis. He's over the age of 80, and we're going to have a new archbishop, archbishop-elect now for Boston, uh, Richard Henning, who had been... Uh, it was a bit of a surprise that he was appointed. What was striking to me about our conversation with uh, Cardinal O'Malley was that uh, how laser-focused he is still. Uh, now, he's not going anywhere. There's still service that he's going to be doing for many, many years for us. But on the work of the night, and I want to go back to something he said, because I think it's very relevant uh, to what we've talked about all day, about the, the role and the, the focus of the nights on parishes. I think... Well, one, it, it, what you're, I agree with you 100%. It sounded like Cardinal O'Malley was just getting rid of one of eight jobs, <laughs> yes. right? So, like, he can now focus on the other seven. Um, what, a, what a gift he's been. I, it's just, it's so moving to see a man who's literally spent his life for the church and in some tough roles and some, uh, for the global church. But it is in the parishes, isn't it, mm -hmm. Matthew? I mean, we've... Um, the United States Catholic Church was built around ethnic parishes. And it was the culture here, and this is what, this is where we still live. And so if any organization is gonna be helpful, they're gonna pick where they're helpful, maybe at college campuses, maybe over the airwaves. But for the heart of the church, it's gonna be around the Eucharist, and that's in the parishes. Yeah. And for the record, you are dressed rather sharply uh, because you are a, a member, a participant in, in this, this is required garb. <laughs> I'm happy to wear it, though. I just... Uh, yes. I did my best. Yeah, well, we'll still let you in. Thank you. We'll still let you in. But to that, the, the idea of all of the members now having this opportunity to celebrate tonight. But again, there's going to be a point to it, which is Cardinal O'Malley's presentation. It's not going to be a swan song. It's not going to be uh, some farewell on his part, because we know he's not going anywhere. But what do you think his message is going to be? I don't know. But what struck me in speaking to him is he's a man who's always looking forward. He's always looking forward. It's not a certain kind of nostalgia. He's not looking back on a career in the way maybe a secular person who's retiring would. It's always how is he going to advance the mission of the church? And it's striking to me his capacity to think globally about evangelization, about service. Yeah. So I expect to learn, as I always do, to learn something from him tonight. And I have to ask you, of course, about uh, Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly's presentation today. What, yeah. were, what were your thoughts? I, I just think it was so, I, you know, I've talked to a number of people, and they feel like it was somehow a major moment for the Knights. And I confess to you that I'm not sure what that means, but just the sense that the people listening thought, this is a shift, mm -hmm. something happened. Uh, you know, he spoke about the kinds of things he speaks about, he spoke about hope, he pointed forward, but there was a sense in the tenor or the spirit of it. And I, I hope they're right. I think maybe the Holy Spirit's doing something profound through that talk. Yeah. That, uh, we talked about it earlier, that threading throughout, as we would expect from the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, but this threading throughout of here we had all of the details of what the order the order's doing here, but also tying it every step of the way to Christ uh, and at the very end also to the Eucharist. You know, he opened the whole thing talking about the few. He quoted Newman. 
the few zealous, undaunted, courageous few, they're the ones who change. If he inspired the few, we'll see mass massive change. Yeah. I know just talking very casually with uh, members yes. who were in the room, in, in the elevator here, just in the lobby of the hotel here, they were deeply moved. And the Knights is the individuals making decisions as a group. Now there's 2.1 million. We're having this impact. I just want to say to the church around the world, be faithful. And I was personally encouraged, like, just stay doing what the Lord has called you to do. And he'll bear the fruit. He'll make sure the fruit comes of it. He'll multiply the, the work. So it was just encouraging in that kind of deep but homey way. Like, just, yeah, I can do this. Holiness is not out there. It's right here. My mission is right here. My family, the ones closest to me, my parish. And the Lord takes all that and does great things with it. And in our conversation with Patrick Kelly after his uh, presentation, he stressed the average night. Yeah. Which I, I really appreciated. Wasn't that a great line? Yeah. Uh, we're on the shoulders of the guys who are just out there. They're handing coats out. They're doing things on the front lines. Um, in a media-driven world, where you think everything is what happens on a screen, it's good to remember that's, that's still not true. Yeah. Every One-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Well, to that, uh, we think that it's very important for everyone to have an opportunity to take another look at the Supreme Knight's presentation. So we're going to take you now to a replay of Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly's presentation here at the 142nd uh, Supreme Convention of the Knights of Columbus in Quebec. And now, please join me in welcoming, for the purpose of making his annual report, our worthy Supreme Knight, Patrick Kelly. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your eminences, your graces, your excellencies, my fellow knights and friends, welcome to our Supreme Convention. We're here to mark 142 years of being on mission. And it's fitting that we're here in Canada, for this is where we first became an international brotherhood, just 15 years after our founding. And since then, we've spread around the world. Everywhere we go, we serve the family and strengthen the faith. And today, I want to express my gratitude to each and every Brother Knight. Thank you for making this a banner year in charity, unity, and fraternity. This is a special year for another reason. It has now been 350 years since the church established the first diocese in Canada, and it happened here in Quebec City. At the time, the diocese stretched from the Arctic Circle to the Gulf of Mexico. And ever since, the Catholic faith has shaped this country and this continent in profound ways and we proudly stand with Canada's bishops and priests to continue this witness. Today, we're especially honored to be with our devoted brother knight, the Archbishop of Quebec and Primate of Canada, Cardinal Gerald Lacroix. Your Eminence, congratulations on this 350th anniversary. Like the church in Quebec, the Knights of Columbus is on mission, a mission given to us by Christ through the founding vision of Blessed Michael McGivney. From the beginning, Knights have been faithful to this mission. And today, we must summon the courage that these times demand. St. John Henry Newman once said that every great change is affected by the few not the many, by the resolute, undaunted, zealous few. This is what you and I must choose to be, resolute, undaunted, 
zealous. It's the only way to advance our mission in these times. And it's how the heroes of our faith have built the church. Consider the very city where we meet. The Quebec we know would not exist without the heroic work of Bishop Francois de Laval and a handful of priests and religious sisters. Each of them could have remained in Europe, but instead they chose to give up everything, risk their lives, and embrace the difficulties that awaited them in New France. The winters were cold, food was scarce, and the need for evangelization was immense. But they met hard times with hard work, standing on the rock of faith. And standing tallest was Bishop Francois de Laval. Here in Quebec, he built the parish that became home to Canada's first cathedral. He built the seminary that trained Canada's first priests. And he built schools and churches and charities, always winning hearts for Christ. It has now been 10 years since his canonization, and Saint Francois de Laval remains an outstanding model of missionary zeal and creative courage. Laval was a builder, a builder of the faith. And so was another priest we all know well, Father Michael McGivney. In his times, Catholic families were struggling. Fathers were dying in factories, leaving widows and orphans with nothing. And the anti-Catholic culture of the 19th century pressured young men to leave the faith. Father McGivney met those challenges head on, building up men in faith and strengthening their families. More than 140 years later, the Knights of Columbus continues to do exactly that. Together, we build up families, parishes, and communities that are centered on Christ. There is no greater task it requires sacrifice and sometimes even suffering. But that's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to be on mission. Father McGivney is our model. Like Bishop de Laval, he spent his life in service to others. And we pray that our founder, like Laval, will soon be recognized as a saint. <laughs> Devotion to Blessed Michael McGivney is growing. Last December, the Patronal Church of the United States, the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, unveiled a marble statue of our founder. It shows Father McGivney holding the Gospels and pointing to the words that define our mission, unity and charity. And this winter, in the heart of New York City, St. Patrick's Cathedral will unveil its own statue of Father McGivney. Cardinal Dolan, thank you for bringing America's parish priest to America's parish church. <laughs> We share in the mission of Father McGivney and Bishop de Laval, a mission of building up the family and the church. The days of easy faith are over. That's as true here in Canada as it is in the United States. It's true in Europe and around the world, and we all see it. In the U.S. alone, at least 85% of Catholics now leave the church by the time they're young adults. In many places around the world, 
Catholic baptisms are declining and secularism is on the rise. And many of us are worried about the world our children will inherit. In these challenging times, our mission matters. We must have the zeal of Bishop de Laval and Father McGivney. Like them, we must build, and we must start by building up a new generation of Catholic men, men formed in faith and virtue, men prepared to be missionary disciples. We're making historic progress. Altogether, we now have 2.1 million members. Last year alone, more than 92,000 men joined our ranks. And to all my brother knights, thank you for achieving one of our best years of growth in a century. <laughs> Men are joining us around the world, from the United States to Ukraine, from the Philippines to France. And this year, marks the 10th anniversary of our expansion into the Republic of Korea. We are joined today by our largest ever Korean delegation of 21 knights. They are led by Bishop Titus So and our territorial deputy, General Shin. To you and all our brother knights in Korea, thank you. We now have almost 17,000 active councils around the world, but one deserves a special mention. The Knights of Columbus arrived in Cuba in 1909, 115 years ago. But our first council there, San Augustine Council 1390, was suppressed in the political turmoil of the 1950s. The same was true for the order in all of Cuba. But that changed five years ago when the Archbishop of Havana asked us to revive the council. We did, and it's now growing along with other councils in Cuba. The Archbishop of Havana is here today. Cardinal Juan Garcia, thank you for bringing the Knights of Columbus back to life in Cuba. We are growing in Mexico, too, where our knights have a new tradition. Each year, they reconsecrate themselves to St. Joseph during their annual pilgrimage to the Shrine of Christ the King in central Mexico. Throughout the country, Mexican knights are bearing witness to the faith. That was on full display last October in Juarez. There, the Knights carried a statue of the Virgin Mary around the city's Olympic Stadium while more than 20,000 prayed the rosary. To our Mexican Knights, thank you for your powerful witness. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva. <laughs> Viva Cristo Rey! <laughs> we're building in the United States as well, and we're welcoming a record number of Hispanic men. Today, nearly a quarter of knights who join online are Hispanic, and in the years ahead, we will welcome even more. Over half of young American Catholics are now Hispanic. They are more than just the church's future. They are vital to the church today. Ultimately, our duty is to reach every Catholic man, and we have been given a unique opportunity. Recently, we commissioned the Center 
for applied research in the apostolate to conduct a national survey in the United States. We asked Catholic men why they join groups like ours, and we also asked them why they don't. The study suggests that as many as seven million men are open to joining groups like the Knights, but the vast majority haven't joined for a simple reason. They haven't been invited. Think about that. Seven million potential Knights, and there are millions more here in Canada, in Mexico, and across Europe and Asia. We have a duty to invite these men to build with us. Today, we have 2.1 million members, but I envision the day when we will have four or five million. Imagine the impact, the communities we could help, the parishes we could serve, and the lives we could change. Father McGivney created the Knights to make that impact. And by inviting the first Knights to join him in a great work, he created a culture of invitation that we must continue to carry forward. And so today, I ask every Knight, will you extend that invitation, that hand of brotherhood, to the next generation? We build up men in faith and friendship, and together we build communities that reflect God's love, especially through our witness to charity. Last year, Knights spent more than 47 million hours serving and sacrificing for the sake of others. And we set a new record for charitable giving. All told, the Knights of Columbus donated more than $190 million to those in need. Our charity is personal. I saw that last November when I visited Annunciation Catholic School in Denver. Most of the students there are underprivileged. Many don't know where their next meal or their next set of clothes will come from. So that morning, we gave out more than a thousand winter jackets through Knights of Columbus Coats for Kids. And it was my great joy to personally give a little girl named Lexi our one millionth coat. I'm grateful to every night who's made Coats for Kids such a huge success. We reached the million coat milestone after 14 years, thanks to your hard work. But we are not done. Today, I have a challenge. I'm calling on all of us to double that number in half the time. The Knights of Columbus will give two million coats to children in need by the year 2030. As we take Coats for Kids to the next level, let's watch a short video starring Lexi. The Knights of Columbus started this program 14 years ago, and it has grown and expanded, and today, we gave out our one millionth coat. This is very exciting for us because the coats have just been amazing for our students. My heart is overflowing with gratitude. Most of these schools are very economically challenged and for many of them, having a new coat is probably beyond their reach. So we know that they'll be feeling warm because of the generous donation by the Knights. I've donated coats in the past uh, to it, so to be able to now uh, be able to hand them out and see the fruits of that is really, really cool. But you never know the kind of difference that you make when you, you do something simple as this uh, for these kids. Uh, it makes a big impact on their lives. 
We're giving away a thousand coats today and we have roughly 25 volunteers that are helping. And so this is right in line with what Father McGivney had visioned for taking care of the families. Father Michael McGivney, you see a lot of miracles that are coming through his intercession and through his spirit that continues in the night. There was a lot of emotions in the room and then when we announced our millionth coat, the girl that was getting her coat, that was so much fun and she was full of smiles. Just getting a coat is amazing. She's been coming here since preschool and she's been getting these coats since then. I would just like to say thank you for everything. Just to see the joy on the kids' faces when they got a new coat, it was really a wonderful thing for us to do as Knights. To all my brother Knights who are involved in Coats for Kids, I would just like to say thank you. That's putting a smile on, on kids' faces. There is no greater thing than to help the family. Our charity takes many forms, and we follow the call of Pope Francis to go to the peripheries. That's where you'll find the Knights serving those who are overlooked. In partnership with the Global Wheelchair Mission, we continue to help those who have lost limbs or cannot walk. Last year, we gave the gift of mobility to more than 11,000 people and we continue to serve persons with physical and intellectual disabilities through our partnership with Special Olympics. We helped organize nearly 4,000 competitions last year, and we donated more than $4 million to make Special Olympics a success. We continue to serve those who are persecuted for our faith. Ten years ago, we promised to help the Christians of the Middle East. Since then, we've rebuilt churches and restored whole communities in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And today, we're standing with the persecuted Christians of Nigeria. There are more than 20 million Catholics in Nigeria, and many live in fear of kidnapping, violence, forced conversion, and even death. Last year, Nigerians accounted for 82% of Christians killed for their faith. This crisis is a call to action. So we asked Nigeria's bishops how we can help. Their answer was unequivocal. They need us to help their people stand strong in the face of persecution by spreading the hope that comes from faith. Today I'm announcing that the order will sponsor a collaboration between the Catholic Bishops Conference of Nigeria and the Franciscan University of Steubenville. We'll fund the ongoing formation of priests and lay leaders and support the creation of a national catechetical institute in Nigeria. Our efforts will reach thousands of parishes and strengthen the faith of millions of Catholics in the heart of Africa. We're joined today by two courageous leaders of the church in Nigeria, Bishop Matthew Kuka and Bishop Stephen Mamza. Your Excellencies, we stand with you to end persecution in Nigeria. We're mindful of Nigeria's children, especially girls who are often targeted by terrorists for kidnapping. And we're also assisting young girls in the neighboring country of Benin. It's one of the most difficult places on the planet to be a girl. So we're helping the sisters of the Company of the Savior build a vocational training center. 
With our support, the sisters will teach young girls in Benin to discover their God-given talents and develop socially and economically. We're honored today to welcome the Superior General of the Sisters of the Company of the Savior. Mother Mercedes Diaz, thank you for what your congregation is doing to help women and girls in Africa. And across the world, we're defending women and girls by fighting the evil of human trafficking. In partnership with the Arise Foundation, we've launched a program in the Philippines called Guardians of Dignity. It's training Filipino knights and others to sound the alarm when they spot the signs of human trafficking. Ultimately, we're helping to mobilize a broader movement in the Philippines and so fulfill Father McGivney's mission of protecting the vulnerable, especially women and children. At last year's Supreme Convention, we adopted a historic resolution condemning the scourge of human trafficking. And we also resolved to stand in solidarity with indigenous peoples. We're fulfilling this promise in many ways. In the United States, South Dakota Knights recently made a pilgrimage to the gravesite of Nicholas Black Elk. He was a man of great holiness who devoted his life to strengthening the faith of the Lakota people. The church has recognized him as a servant of God, and we pray for his beatification. South Dakota Knights also provided wheelchairs on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And when they learned that many of the reservation's children had no beds to sleep on, they built and delivered 100 new beds. And at this convention, we'll do the same for children of the First Nations. Before the week is out, we will build more than 100 beds and the first ones will go to the huron Wandat First Nation just 15 kilometers from here. In June, Knights organized a pilgrimage to Canada's National Shrine of St. Kateri Tekekwitha. Pope Francis praised Kateri, the Lily of the Mohawks, during his visit to Canada two years ago, hailing her exemplary devotion to prayer and work. Inspired by her example, on a single day, Knights distributed 600 winter coats to children in the Tubik and Denny First Nations. Many of those children received their coats from Graydon Nicholas, the former Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick who served on our board of directors and is a member of the Maliseet First Nation. Graydon, you have been a powerful voice for indigenous communities and we thank you for your leadership. We build up indigenous communities in faith and charity. And worldwide, we continue to rebuild communities hit by natural disaster. We devoted more than $1 million to disaster relief last year. And we responded to each crisis with immediate action. Just days after our convention in Orlando last year, wildfires devastated the Hawaiian island of Maui. They almost completely destroyed the town of Lahaina. Even before the smoke had cleared, more than 200 knights swung into action. 
They delivered supplies by sea, land, and air, and they quickly began the work of rebuilding, starting with the local Catholic school, Sacred Hearts. It had burned to the ground, leaving 120 families with nowhere to turn. With support from around the world, our Hawaiian Knights built a temporary school, and they did it in less than three weeks. Thanks to them, Sacred Hearts reopened in time for the school year. And on the first day of class, 11 teachers showed up to work despite having lost their own homes in the fire. Their dedication touched our hearts. So we stepped in with immediate financial support to help those courageous teachers rebuild their lives. One of them wrote to me. She said that she's, quote, more grateful than we will ever know. And reflecting on our efforts, Bishop Larry Silva of Honolulu called the Knights the face of the church. I could say more about our efforts in Maui, but it's better for you to see for yourself. I'll never forget that day, that entire north bank of the school had been completely burnt down, including other buildings on that side of the property. The parish is standing, but the school burned down. They had maybe 120 families registered with the school. And if I'm not mistaken, over 50 of those families lost their homes. We're the only Catholic entity out here in West Maui, the church and the school itself. I felt compelled and confirmed in the mission that I'm supposed to continue Catholic education here. The Knights of Columbus are probably our biggest supporter when it comes to our projects and initiatives in providing relief to Maui. They were the obvious choice to partner with. The Knights have really taken uh, as a project, building semi-permanent structures for these students in order to have safe learning environments. I'm really proud of what the Knights have done, and in addition to being first on scene, they're still there months after the fires. Now that we have four new tents up and running that are acting as temporary classrooms, we now can have the children come into school daily to receive learning in person and not just virtually. And so that's been very impactful to the community. The students, when they first returned to school, that first day was very emotional because they've been traumatized by what has happened. They were just so happy to see each other and so grateful that they were safe. And we came to the assembly here in the church yesterday and then watched them go to their rooms for the first time. And that made it all worthwhile. I'm just in awe of the Knights of Columbus and the overwhelming support that I've showed, not just our students, but our faculty and staff. For me, it represents what the church at large should be, a group of people who pray together, who have fun together, who work together, who cry together, who mourn together, and who face challenges together. And that's what the Knights have always represented to me. Hawaiian nights were truly heroic. And there's another kind of service that's heroic too. At this very moment, thousands of knights are serving their countries in uniform. We're proud of them and we support them through our 72 military councils and special initiatives for those who serve. 23 years ago, we published Armed with the Faith. It's a simple, accessible Catholic handbook for military personnel. And we've now distributed more than 600,000 copies. As someone who served in uniform, I've experienced the pressures of military life, and I know the support and consolation that comes from our faith. Armed with the faith, 
didn't exist when I was deployed, but since then I've often heard about its impact. I recently received a letter from a knight named Logan Erickson, a private in the U.S. Army. One day after Mass, Logan picked up a copy of Armed with the Faith. He told me it helped him get through basic training, and it deepened his faith and his commitment to the order, and he resolved to become a fourth-degree knight. He ended the letter by thanking the knights for all we do to support those who serve. But Private Erickson, if you're listening, we are the ones who should be thanking you. Those who serve defend our freedom. And as knights, we defend our rights in other ways. In partnership with the Religious Freedom Institute, we'll soon launch a First Amendment training program for military and college councils. The threats to religious liberty are real and rising, but the knights are ready to meet them. We stood against the hatred of the Ku Klux Klan in the early 20th century. We confronted the nativist legacy of the know-nothings who said Catholics couldn't be loyal citizens. And today, we're fighting the new bigotry that aims to silence people of faith in Canada, in the United States, and around the world. One council deserves a special mention. For more than 60 years, Petersburg Council 694 in Virginia has held a Memorial Day Mass at Poplar Grove National Cemetery. But this year, the federal government tried to block it. Virginia Knights refused to let this injustice stand. They sued to protect their First Amendment rights. The federal government backed down because the Knights of Columbus stood strong. And on the global stage, anti-Christian bigotry has become more aggressive and blatant. That was on full display at the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics, where our Lord and the Last Supper were outrageously mocked. The Olympics should be a celebration of God's gifts and the triumph of human achievement, but in Paris, we saw blasphemy, a vile and intentional denigration of our faith. As Catholics and as Knights, we are rightly angry. But even more than that, we are resolved. We are Knights, and we stand with Christ our King, and we will not be silent. We will always stand for human rights and human dignity. The challenges we face vary by country, but they're especially dire for our brother knights in Ukraine. They are fighting for their lives and their country's survival. It's been two and a half years since Russia launched its unjust war. Since day one, the order has rallied to support the people of Ukraine and we're continuing to expand our partnerships. With the Protez Foundation, we are providing prosthetics for the victims of war. And with the Knights of Malta, we're training civilians in life-saving first aid. 
I'd like to recognize and thank Fra John Dunlop, the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta, who truly honors us with his presence today. Our KFC charity convoys have now delivered more than 8.5 million pounds of relief supplies to shattered communities. KFC Mercy Centers and programs have given material and spiritual aid to more than 1.6 million refugees, mostly women and children. And through the Ukraine Solidarity Fund, we've already provided more than $17 million in humanitarian relief. The Russian authorities have taken notice. In fact, they've officially banned the Knights of Columbus from the territory they occupy. Let me be clear, their ban is our badge of honor. The fact is, the entire Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has been banned. Russian authorities are using faith as a weapon of war, and what they fear most is the Church's message of human freedom. But Ukraine's bishops and priests will not be silenced, and that includes two great witnesses who have traveled from Ukraine to be with us today, Archbishop Mogshidsky of Lviv and Bishop Bubni of Odessa. Your Excellencies, we are grateful that you are here. One story shows the courage of Catholics in Ukraine in an especially powerful way. In the early days of the war, Russian forces captured the city of Melitopol. It's the home of St. Peter Council 16252, and its chaplain, Father Alexander Bahomas, refused to abandon his parishioners. The occupation left Melitopol with little food little fuel, and urgent medical needs. From the very start, Father Alexander fed the hungry and cared for the sick. And he brought the sacraments to his parishioners who were trapped in their homes. It didn't take long for Russian intelligence to learn his name. They put him under surveillance, came to his parish, and then to his rectory. They interrogated him multiple times and even threatened to execute him. And they repeatedly asked Father Alexander about his participation in the Knights of Columbus. He said, and I quote, they accused me of being the one who recruits men to the Knights. And it's true, I did encourage our men to become Knights. Father Alexander was eventually arrested and deported, and he's here today. Father, your courage is an inspiration to all of us. In February, Ukraine State Deputy Yuri Maletsky sent me a letter about the order's humanitarian relief efforts. He wrote, 
We can calculate the number of food boxes, packages, the amount of clothes, the weight of medicines and medical equipment, but we will never be able to put a number on the value of this help because human life has no price. Yuri ended with a request to all of us. I appeal to you, he said, to continue to remember us in your prayers and not to leave us alone. Yuri Maletsky, we hear you, and I promise all our Ukrainian knights, we will never abandon you. Our Polish knights are keeping this promise in a unique way. They've welcomed refugees with open arms, and they keep our mercy centers and charity convoys running. These knights are continuing the legacy of their countrymen, and that includes the family of Yusuf and Victoria Alma, who gave their lives rescuing Jews in World War II. Pope Francis approved the Alma family's beatification last year. They became the first family beatified together, including the unborn child in Victoria's womb. We've created a special exhibit featuring relics of the entire family at the St. John Paul II National Shrine in Washington, D.C. We are honored to tell the story of the Alma family and we will strive to follow their heroic example of defending the most vulnerable. We have a solemn duty to protect families, a duty rooted in our founding. Since the days of Father McGivney, we've pooled our money to help widows and orphans, and we've built our life insurance program around the same principle of mutual aid. When families lose a loved one, we are there for them, just as we have always been. We now protect Catholic families with more than $123 billion of life insurance. We value the trust our families place in us, and we're widely recognized for our stewardship of their financial well-being. Forbes has named us one of America's best life insurance companies for three years running. Standard & Poor's awarded us a superior rating again this year, and we've now had top marks from AM Best for 40 years in a row. But life insurance is only one part of how we serve families. We also help them plan for their future through Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors. Knights of Columbus mutual funds are available to anyone who wants to invest in line with the Catholic faith. And we help Catholic institutions steward their resources. We now manage more than $2.2 billion for dioceses, religious communities, and families. And every dollar we invest respects the church's moral teaching. This is also true of the Knights of Columbus Charitable Fund, KCCF. We launched it five years ago, and this year we passed a major milestone. Through KCCF, a wide variety of generous donors have now given more than $100 million to over 2,000 worthy charities. Our continued growth proves the timeless value of Father McGivney's vision. But it's also a testament to the tireless work of our fellow Knights. 1,000 K of C insurance agents advance our mission every day. They do outstanding work, and I couldn't be more grateful for their commitment and their professionalism. 
When I became Supreme Knight, I asked Bob Marlowe and Joe DeCaligero to be my senior insurance advisors. Both of these men have been top performing general agents for decades, and they know what it takes to keep us strong and growing. After a combined 85 years of building up the Knights, they're both retiring this year. Bob Marlowe and Joe DeCaligero, thank you for serving the order so well for so long. We protect families because they are a gift from God. And the same sense of mission compels us to defend all human life. In Canada and the United States, we're fighting the evil of assisted suicide. In May, we were a leading sponsor of a joint conference on end-of-life care organized by the Canadian and U.S. bishops' conferences. With them, we reject the lie that some lives are not worth living, that suffering is meaningless, and that we can be the masters of our final destiny. We know that God is the author of life, and our responsibility, our duty, is to cherish and protect life, not end it. The same goes for children and their mothers. We steadfastly defend their dignity and right to life. Again last year, we participated in national pro-life marches around the world. And in the U.S., Knights organized and joined state marches from coast to coast. Before the March for Life in Washington, D.C., we held the second annual Life Fest. We co-hosted it with the Sisters of Life, and all told, more than 6,000 young people joined us. They came to celebrate the gift of human life. And while we aimed to inspire them, it was their joy that inspired us. The pro-life movement is young and vibrant, and it fills us with hope. Take a look at this video, and I think you'll see what I mean. Today, the Sisters of Life with the Knights of Columbus are hosting our Life Fest event. First and foremost, we're here to gather to give glory to God, who is the Lord of life. We want to praise Him and not only claim that truth, but witness that truth today as we go forth from here to the March for Life. To me as Supreme Knight, it is so encouraging to see the witness here at Life Fest of young people coming together, all supporting life. And it's a sign, I think, of what Christ can do by sparking their hearts. In the Knights of Columbus were here last year when we first started Life Fest to make sure that even after Roe v. Wade was overturned, that we were not gonna give up on building a culture of life. And I'm so proud to say that in just one year, we've doubled the amount of people that are coming to Life Fest. Young people's involvement in the pro-life cause is so important because when anyone sees a youth that is alive and passionate for life, it is contagious, it is far spreading and their lives will have so much impact on this world and bringing God's love to each and every person that they encountered. The Knights of Columbus are uniquely suited to help the pro-life cause because it's made up of men who really care for the faith and who care for fighting for the values of the Catholic Church. When you have a group of men who are dedicated, then great things can be accomplished. It's very, very important that young men recognize their own special role in church and society, their role to become good men, virtuous men, men of strength, men of great love and great service and courage. We are helping usher people to their seats, usher for communion and to set up for mass. Being able to stand and give to other people is something that the Knights really stand for and it's something that I've really taken to heart since joining the Knights. 
It's just an amazing opportunity for someone to encounter the Lord and the dignity that he gives them by their very existence. Dismantling unjust laws are only the beginning. We still have the arduous task of creating a pro-life culture, of changing people's minds and hearts. I think there's another reality at work here, and, and it is this reality of just of solidarity, of young people coming together for life. There's strength in numbers. We see and hear a message of the beauty of human life. We go out and spread the message far and wide, raising up new generations of pro-life leadership. With Roe v. Wade gone, laws now protect unborn life in nearly half of the United States. And the best estimates say that pro-life laws have prevented one out of every four abortions. Our annual Marist polling continues to show that two-thirds of Americans want real legal limits on abortion. But in many places, we've faced a tough slog at the ballot box. And this November alone, as many as 11 states may put abortion before voters. Life may prevail in some of them, but the abortion industry is fighting hard with fear and lies. The United States is not the only country where life is at risk. France put the so-called right to abortion in its constitution last year. And recently in Mexico, the Supreme Court ruled that pro-life state laws were unconstitutional. The reality is we are not just fighting legal and policy battles. We are fighting what John Paul II described as a culture of death and what Pope Francis has called a throwaway culture. Ultimately, this battle is spiritual. As St. Paul told the Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness. We must remember this, especially when the road is steep. No matter what happens, our faith demands that we continue to pray and push forward in hope. And I know that when it comes to supporting vulnerable mothers and their unborn children, the Knights of Columbus will never waver. Our witness to charity can build a culture of life. Last year, we placed 135 ultrasound machines in pregnancy resource centers throughout the United States. That brings our total to more than 1,800 ultrasounds, with many more on the way. Our ultrasound initiative is saving thousands of lives every year. And we've taken our newest pro-life initiative to new heights. Through our ASAP program, Aid and Support After Pregnancy, in just two years, we have donated more than $11 million to pregnancy centers and maternity homes. <laughs> that is more than double our initial goal. ASAP has been so successful because our pro-life witness is rooted in love. And while some may be tempted to discouragement, we must give hope to those around us, reminding them that the greatest victories often spring from adversity. The pro-life movement is proof. 
When Roe v. Wade made abortion on demand the law of the land, we did not give up. We rallied to the cause with courage and perseverance. And after five decades of hard work, we prevailed. Today, the work is even harder, but it doesn't matter how hard it is or how long it takes, we will never stop building a culture of life. The pro-life movement is a powerful witness to the love of Christ. And as Knights, we also witness to that love in many other ways. That includes our unfailing support for the church. Through our vocations support program, RSVP, we gave more than $4.1 million last year to the formation of seminarians and women religious in Canada, the United States, and around the world. And we supported dioceses and religious communities in the ongoing education of priests and women religious. In Rome, we helped American, Canadian, and Filipino priests prepare to become the church's future teachers and leaders. And working closely with Cardinal Mark Ouellette, we once again sponsored a major theological conference on vocations at the Vatican. We're also proud to help the Holy See mission to the United Nations. This year marks its 60th anniversary. To celebrate this milestone, we're strengthening our long history of support for the mission as it brings the church's prophetic voice to the world stage. One night here can personally attest to the importance of Vatican diplomacy. We're honored today to be joined by our former Deputy Supreme Knight who served with distinction as Canada's ambassador to the Holy See. Ambassador Denis Savoy, thank you for your service to God, to Canada, and to the Knights of Columbus. We're also helping the Vatican's historical archives restore precious documents from the missionaries who brought the gospel to North America. Catholics on this continent can trace our heritage to these letters from giants of our faith, like John Carroll, Jean de Brebeuf, and Junipero Serra. The church's work of evangelization continues in all our countries, but we know that to change the world, we must first be changed ourselves. A man cannot give what he does not have. And as Catholic men, we need to have a living faith. That's why we started CORE, to gather and build up men through prayer, faith formation, and fraternity. CORE is meant to transform us by drawing us closer to Christ and to each other. And as men grow together in faith and fraternity, they grow as husbands, fathers, and citizens. In less than two years, more than 650 councils have started CORE, and nearly 4,000 have plans to start this transformational initiative in the coming year. CORE is answering an urgent need for a deepened faith and an authentic Catholic brotherhood. We live in a time of unprecedented isolation. In the United States, more than a quarter of millennials say they have no close friends. 
and nearly the same number say they have no friends at all. Men in particular are suffering from loneliness, but CORE gives them a place to connect, to open up their lives to one another about the hopes they have and the challenges they face at work and more importantly, in their families. CORE helps men find and form authentic Christian friendships. I believe this is the reason CORE has been adopted with such enthusiasm. As Catholic men grow closer to one another, they grow closer to Christ. As one deputy grand knight put it, CORE is answering what the church needs today. Every core group is different. Many are using our Men of the Word Bible study, and others are watching our newest video series, Into the Breach, The Mission of the Family. It gives actionable insights for husbands and fathers, and in less than a year, it has been viewed over 1.5 million times. We have a wealth of content to use in CORE, and there's even more on the way. Earlier this summer, I announced a new partnership with the Augustine Institute. It's one of the best producers of Catholic content in the world, and we're making its resources available to Knights. We now have a dedicated section on Formed, their popular streaming service. Knights can access award-winning videos featuring some of the church's best teachers and speakers. And through this collaboration, we're already developing new tailor-made resources specifically for CORE. We're doing this work to deepen our faith and strengthen our families. And as always, we're blessed to have the support of our wives. Our wives are essential partners in everything we do. I was reminded of this truth in a powerful way last fall when I had the honor to, to give the eulogy at Anne Deccan's funeral. Anne was the devoted wife of Supreme Knight Virgil Deccan. He led the order with distinction for 23 years, and she served the knights no less than him. Through it all, she sacrificed for her family and the order with heroic generosity. Anne cared for her young children and raised them to know and love Christ, all the while assisting her husband as he led a growing global organization. And in her final moments on earth, she prayed with a relic of blessed Michael McGivney. We are joined today by Anne and Virgil's daughter, Karen Thompson. Karen, we are forever grateful for the work and the witness of your mother and father. As Catholic families, the ultimate source of our strength is Jesus Christ. And as knights, we're especially devoted to Christ in the Eucharist. For the last two years, U.S. Catholics have looked to the Blessed Sacrament in a profound way through the National Eucharistic Revival. It included four pilgrimages this summer each starting on opposite ends of the country. Thousands of knights and their families joined these processions for 60 days and over 6,500 miles, tracing a living sign of the cross over the nation. The Seton route 
began on the East Coast in the parish where Father McGivney founded the Knights. From St. Mary's Church in New Haven, pilgrims followed our Eucharistic Lord through New York, Baltimore, and Washington. They crossed the Appalachians into Pennsylvania and Ohio before reaching Indianapolis. I had the privilege of joining that same procession on Memorial Day weekend. I traveled into New York City with my wife, Vanessa, and our youngest daughter, Meg. We walked with pilgrims as they made their way from St. Patrick's Cathedral through Manhattan. As we processed down Lexington Avenue, one of the organizers noticed the KFC logo on my shirt. He asked, are you a knight? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm a knight. <laughs> then he asked if I'd help carry the canopy, and I said that I would be honored. It was a truly amazing experience. Tourists knelt on the sidewalk and took videos. Waiters came outside and crossed themselves. Onlookers broke into spontaneous applause. And all the while, hundreds of pilgrims sang songs and bore witness to Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. Even on the streets of New York City, it was clear, Jesus is alive, he's real, and he's changing hearts. All four pilgrimages converged in Indianapolis at the 10th National Eucharistic Congress. There, I joined more than 54,000 fellow pilgrims, including thousands of my brother knights and their families. The stadium was electric. It was alive with the Holy Spirit. And the moment I will never forget was when the entire arena went utterly dark except for our Eucharistic Lord illuminated on the altar. A deep silence came over everyone, and there was a profound sense that we were all having a personal encounter with Jesus, heart speaking to heart. In that moment, we all realized God is actively renewing his church. The Eucharistic Congress was deeply moving, and I'd like to give you a glimpse of that experience. The Eucharistic Revival has been a beautiful process of helping everybody to renew their love for the Eucharist. And it's a special moment where we renew our desire to be Eucharistic missionaries, because we know that the Eucharist is the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to be here with all of you, my fellow pilgrims and my brother knights. Look around you tonight, 50,000 people overflowing with excitement and joy, not for a sports team, not for a musician, but for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's almost surreal to finally be here. My favorite part is adoration every evening. There's over 50,000 people just worshiping our Lord in the monsters. You can feel the Holy Spirit, it's palpable. I think we forget a lot of times as a national church that we have something that so many others don't. Christ is among us. We are really hoping to just show people what the Knights of Columbus are all about. Father McGivney founded the Knights, and he was really devoted to the Eucharist, and so we're trying to carry on his mission and vision for the Order today. Today we're participating in the actual Eucharistic procession through downtown Indianapolis. We've invaded the streets of Indianapolis for these past few days. This procession is going to be the moment where we bring our Lord to this city in a public way. 
I would say the pilgrimage is not concluded. I would say this is a commencement. We talk about evangelization. At the end of the day, evangelization is you and I being willing to share how God has blessed my life. If you're willing to talk about that, you are evangelizing people. You're allowing others to encounter Christ through you. I hope that people will walk away from here with a realization that no matter what we do, how well we do it, we cannot forget our first love, which is Jesus Christ present to us in the Eucharist. It's pretty amazing to see the Knights of Columbus coming here to Indianapolis. It's awe-inspiring to see the faith on fire and just everyone loving their faith, everyone having the same thing in common. When I was installed as Supreme Knight, I called on all Knights to be, first and foremost, Knights of the Eucharist. The Eucharistic Congress showed us what that means in our time. And so did an extraordinary Brother Knight so many years ago. The year was 1966. The place was this very city. And the man was Lieutenant Governor of Quebec, Paul Comtois. He was a devout Catholic and a devoted knight who, as a younger man, had served as Grand Knight of Council 1889. He had long petitioned the Archbishop of Quebec for permission to reserve the Blessed Sacrament in the Lieutenant Governor's residence. After repeated requests, the Archbishop finally relented, but he had one condition, that Paul Comtois would personally safeguard the Eucharist. One night, the Comtois family awoke to a raging fire. The Lieutenant Governor carried his wife outside to safety and helped his daughter escape through a chapel window. But he remained in the house he still had a solemn duty. When the blaze died down, rescuers went in. They found Paul's lifeless body beneath a collapsed stairway. But they didn't just find his charred remains. They found something else, something sacred. He was still clutching the picks which contained the Blessed Sacrament. My fellow knights, Lieutenant Governor Paul Comtois sacrificed his life for the Eucharist. This is our call, to be knights of the Eucharist, to serve our Lord in all we do. We answered that call in new and renewed ways over the last year. And as we look to the year ahead, we do so with great confidence and joy. In 2025, the church will celebrate a Jubilee year, and the Knights of Columbus is preparing the way. For the last Jubilee in the year 2000, we restored the holy door of St. Peter's Basilica. And for this Jubilee, we're helping restore the Baldacchino, the massive bronze canopy crafted by Bernini that rises 10 stories above the papal altar and St. Peter's tomb. And today, I'm pleased to announce that we will assist with another landmark restoration, Bernini's bronze masterpiece at the altar of the chair of St. Peter. It contains the relics of the very chair used by our first pope, and it honors the authority of all his successors. There are few more important places in all of Christendom. 
These renewed works of sacred art will deepen the faith of all who see them, especially in the coming Jubilee year. Pope Francis has made hope the Jubilee year's central message. And our duty as Catholics and as Knights is to witness to the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. Hope is at the heart of who we are. It led Father McGivney and the first Knights to band together, trusting that through them, our Lord would do great things. Hope led them to provide for widows and orphans. Hope led them to strengthen the family and defend the church. The work they began was uncertain, the future unknown. But God has blessed the Knights of Columbus beyond what those men could have ever imagined. And we trust that God will bless our work too. Like the men who gathered in the basement of St. Mary's, we have the hope that comes from faith. It compels us to continue building up our parishes and our families. And like those first nights, we trust in the living God who holds the future in his hands. He will guide us as he did our forefathers. And like them, he calls us to go on mission. We gladly answer this call and we promise to be like Blessed Michael McGivney and Saint Francois de Laval as together we build a future of hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Viva Jesus. That was Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly and his presentation here at the Supreme Convention. We take you now to the state's dinner. We've had a warm welcome here in Quebec, starting with a beautiful opening mass and such an inspiring homily this morning by our host ordinary, Cardinal Gerald Lacroix. He was ordained a priest of the Secular Institute of Pius X in 1988 and began his apostolic ministry here in 2009 as an auxiliary bishop of Quebec. He was appointed chief shepherd of this archdiocese in 2011 and in 2014 was among the first cardinals created by Pope Francis. He serves as a member of several Vatican dicasteries and last year, Pope Francis appointed him to the Council of Cardinals which advises the Holy Father on the governance of the church. His eminence has been a knight for more than 20 years and has been an extraordinary advocate for the Knights of Columbus here in Quebec and beyond. Please join me in welcoming His Eminence Cardinal Lacroix. Chers frères et sœurs, bonsoir et bienvenue. Welcome, bienvenidos, to our Korean brothers, Wan Yeong, to our Polish brothers, Potivanie, to our Ukrainian brothers, Laskavo Prosimo, and to our Filipino brothers, Maligayang, Pagdating. Oh. 
The joy I am experiencing in receiving you, my brother Knights, and your families to Quebec this year is more than I can describe. I am sure that I speak also on behalf of all the Brother Knights of Quebec and probably of Canada also, and as the faithful of Archdiocese. Accepting to come to our country for this unique experience is a blessing for all of us. Dear Worthy Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly and your great team, thank you for all the hard work you have put in to preparing and to help us celebrate this 142nd convention, Supreme Convention. Accepting to come this year to Quebec as we celebrate the 350th anniversary of the establishment of this diocese is a gift we will cherish for many, many years to come. We so needed your youthful and joyful presence. And here you are, all of you. You've come to help us celebrate, and we are very thankful. Holy men and women founded this diocese. Courageous and zealous missionaries who left their native Europe to come evangelize the new world and build human and Christian communities here. We owe them so much. And here we are 350 years later. A lot has been done, and we are proud and thankful for God's blessing and faithfulness as we have written these pages of history. We have been blessed by an unwavering support of the Brother Knights in Quebec in our local churches, and for that we are extremely grateful. 70,000 Knights actually in this province of Quebec. What a gift. And in this diocese of Quebec, more than 12,000 knights live, serve, love, and support the church and its mission. What a blessing. Of course, a lot still needs to be done to continue to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to today's tortured and suffering world. I am overwhelmed with joy to welcome all of you knights and your families you have come from many regions of the world, and your presence in our midst is a visible sign of what missionary disciples are, in love with Jesus and with humanity, both. We don't only love God, we love our brothers and sisters. You are filled with joy, love, and respect for all, generous, engaged in serving all those in need, in the service of life. That is what I know and have experienced of the Knights of Columbus in these past years. Listen very carefully. We need you more than you can ever imagine to continue our journey. The church needs you. The church needs you, the world needs you. Don't let anybody tell you that you are just volunteers who help us out, giving a few or many hours of work a week. You are not only fundraisers, you are on a mission. We are on mission together. That is what Jesus wanted for his disciples. That is how the church grew and spread all over the world over these past 2,000 years. And we don't want to change that recipe. We belong together, walking together, because that's what works. We need, <coughs> excuse me, we need to learn to better share our missionary activity to help our communities grow in faith and love. Please, please continue 
to be involved in your local parishes and in your diocese and your organizations. Your presence is love in action and that, that is vital to build healthy communities. You know, the first time I attended a Supreme Convention was in 2011 in Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City. I remember that, yes. You know, I have to admit, I was rather intimidated to have to sit up here on a dais during the state's dinner. And I'll tell you why. I felt like I was on display with more than 2,000 pairs of eyes looking at me and all of us. But over the years, I've discovered that I had misunderstood the reason why we're up here. We're not at he up here so that you can look at us. We are here to look at you and admire you and thank God that you exist and that you are so involved. And we've got a great view here. We see what you're eating, not eating, drinking and not drinking. <laughs> your joyous and dynamic presence is a blessing for us, your pastors, and I'm sure also for all those of the leadership of the Knights of Columbus. So let us contemplate you and allow us to express our deep appreciation for who you are and stand for and for all you do. You know what is admirable about you, Brother Knights? And I'll finish on that. That's a cue. I'm, ter I'm finishing. <laughs> you know what I admire about you people? You don't just talk about mission. What is urgent, what needs to be done, you are on mission. You are mission. Brothers and sisters, enjoy the Supreme Convention in Quebec, enjoy our city and our region and all it has to offer. Many of, me have told you, many of you have told me, wow, we should come back again next year. I agree with that, by the way. <laughs> but uh, well, I know there are other beautiful cities to visit. We have large countries to visit yet and many places in the world. May the Lord bless this new Colombian apostolic fraternal year. May he bless you, your families, your councils and assemblies, your churches. And please pray for us. Pray for me. May God bless you all. Be bat Jesus. Thank you so very much, Your Eminence. From our founding, Father McGivney founded the Knights of Columbus, and he has always, we have always worked closely with parish priests. We strive to be the strong right arm of our parish priests. And whether that parish is around the corner, or even if it's the largest and most important church in Christendom. It's a great joy and honor to welcome to his first Supreme Convention a very special guest from Vatican City. You might say he is the parish priest of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. A conventual Franciscan, he was ordained to the priesthood in the year 2000 and later served as custos of the sacred convent of St. Francis in Assisi. He was appointed an archbishop in October 2020 and elevated to the College of Cardinals the following month. In February 2021, the Holy Father appointed him archpriest of the Papal Basilica of St. Peter. He's also president of the Fabrica di San Pietro, which is entrusted with the care and maintenance of the great patrimony and spiritual treasures of St. Peter's. Please join me in welcoming His Eminence Mauro Cardinal Gambetti.
sorry. My English is uh, poor English. But I, I think we have to recover because uh, uh, Vatican song is missing. Uh, <laughs> we can sing uh, all together. Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus, Christus imperat. Okay. I'm uh, here to thanks, um, to thank, <laughs> thank you, thank uh, the um, Knights of Columns. Also on behalf uh, of uh, Pope Francis, and I'm especially grateful to Patrick Kelly, Supreme Knight, for inviting me to this uh, Supreme Convention. I received the invitation with joy, not only as an occasion to share these days of dialogue and fraternal communion with the grand family of the Knights of Columbus, but also for the opportunity to acquaint myself with the many and diverse good works you are carrying out all over the world, like I heard. And the, the parish priest of St. Peter is the parish priest of the world. And so <laughs> I participate with you to your actions in the, your mission in the world. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. In bringing you all my, you all, my warmest greetings, I'd also like to express my personal gratitude and uh, the appreciation of the Fabrica di San Pietro for the marvelous and productive uh, collaboration that unites our uh, institutions. An ongoing uh, cooperation spanning for decades for the conservation of the Basilica and uh, of its uh, immense patrimony of works of art, which are first and foremost works of faith. Much has been and is being accomplished in St. Peter's Basilica, thanks to generous financial support from the esteemed order of the Knights of Columbus, a support silently offered in the highest spirit of service to the church and to, to the pontiff, which is also showing its fruits in the preparation of the great jubilee we are marching towards. Indeed, within a few months, Pope Francis shall open St. Peter's Holy Door, inaugurating the Holy Year of Hope, a year which, as he has written in the Bull of Indiction of, for the Jubilee, Spes non confundit, may it be for everyone a moment of uh, a living and personal encounter with the Lord Jesus, the door of salvation. Thanks uh, to donations from the Knights of Columbus, a new and uh, sophisticated uh, state-of-the-art lighting system is being installed in the basement uh, of the Basilica, while the great temple itself has been resounding for many months now with the major restoration of the Bernini's Baldacchino. You can see on, on my back. <laughs> Let me praise the Knights of Columbus once again 
for having uh, lavished uh, themselves to shoulder this enterprise with the Fabrica di San Pietro, an undertaking uh, as grandiose uh, as the very canopy of gilded bronze rising solemnly over the high altar, altar under Michelangelo's dome. This uh, necessary restoration, albeit demanding and difficult, has now reached its final stages, and you can already admire the masterful gildings that time and the deterioration had altered had, and been hidden with layers for, of dirt and deposited substances. Encouraged by the excellence of the overall of the baldacchino, the Fabrica di San Pietro has recently initiated the, monument, the monumental restoration of the chair of San Peter, with the four colossal gilded bronze figures of the fathers of the church under the dove of the Holy Spirit, surrounded by the sunburst of angels in glory. The monument highlights the primacy of Peter and therefore of the Pope is a successor as the guide of the Universal Church. This restoration as well, which the Knights of Columbus have decided to uphold with the munificence, munificence you are known for, comes with a strong symbolic significance in the ambit of the initiatives undertaken for the coming Holy Year. Let me conclude. Wishing to give voice to my sincere sentiments of gratitude toward each one of you, starting with our dearest Supreme Knight, for, for this extended act of generosity, absolutely in keeping with your mission in the world to operate to the benefit of the weakest, of the marginalized, of families and uh, households, whose material, material and spiritual needs you seek to provide for according to the teachings of the gospel, perfectly in harmony to, with the very vocation of St. Peter's Basilica, the beating heart of Christianity and the emblem of a church that is open and welcoming to all of humankind. Pope Francis repeat always to all, to all of humankind. Let me entrust your mission and your families to the care of the most holy virgin. And let me embrace you with my blessings as a brother to all of you. And I wait for you next year in St. Peter to enjoy with, uh, with you and uh, to praise God. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Eminence. It's now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, another close collaborator of Pope Francis and an esteemed Brother Knight. Even while serving in many key positions in the church, he has remained always, first and foremost, a prayerful and humble Capuchin friar with a heart for the Lord and his people. Ordained in 1970, he opened El Centro Católico Hispano in the Archdiocese of Washington, 
for immigrants and those needing public services. He also served as Episcopal vicar for Hispanic, Portuguese, and Haitian communities and led the Archdiocesan Office of Social Ministry. In 1984, he was named co-adjutor bishop of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. After eight years there, he was named Bishop of Fall River, Massachusetts. And 10 years thereafter, he became Bishop of Palm Beach in Florida. Recognizing his unique experience and pastoral gifts, Pope John Paul II named him Archbishop of Boston in 2003. He was among the first group of cardinals created by Pope Benedict XVI in 2006. Shortly after the March 2013 papal election, Pope Francis selected him to serve on his newly formed Council of Cardinals. Later, the Holy Father appointed him as the first president of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. These are just some of the highlights of a great and humble life of service which includes more than 30 years of membership in the Knights of Columbus. Just yesterday, our Holy Father appointed Cardinal O'Malley's successor, Archbishop-designate Richard Henning, who will be installed as Archbishop of Boston on October 31st. Your Excellency, Please know that we are all praying for you. You have some big sandals to fill. <laughs> now, please join me in thanking His Eminence Sean Cardinal O'Malley for his decades of faithful service as we welcome him for his keynote address. Thank you very much, Patrick. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. It's a great joy and a privilege to be with you here tonight. Uh, I feel humbled to have been asked to give this keynote tonight. But uh, Back in 1960, I was a young seminarian preparing to join a German-American province of Capuchins. I was an Irish infiltrator. So I was very happy to have the opportunity to go to Bavaria to improve my German. I was shocked when I got there and realized that virtually all the men in Bavaria wore short pants. Now, when I was growing up, real men did not eat quiche <laughs> or wear short pants. Hopalong Cassidy, the Lone Ranger, Roy Rogers would never wear short pants. So there I was, like the other German seminarians, dressed in our later hosen. They were short pants made of leather with those big decorative suspenders, which were very necessary because the pants weighed about 50 pounds. <laughs> in those days in Bavaria, the lederhosen constituted the normal attire for men in church, in the office, in the fields, in school, and parties always. So at one point, I went with the German seminarians to Rome. It was such a thrill, my first trip to Rome. We were so anxious to visit St. Peter's Basilica. We rushed up the steps to the basilica only to be stopped by a Swiss guard who lowered his spear to block our entrance. And he said to us in German, you boys can't go into St. Peter's in short pants. <laughs> I cannot repeat the colorful response of the German seminarians, but I was afraid they were going to beat up the Swiss guard. Forty years later, I returned to Rome for World Youth Day 
in the year 2000. I was standing near that same spot in front of St. Peter's Basilica. I was with an old Italian cardinal, a very wise man, and as we watched these thousands and thousands of young people going through the holy doors, the cardinal made the observation, he said, look at these young people from every nation under heaven. He said, they're all dressed the same. They were in blue jeans, t-shirts, backward baseball caps, and tennis shoes. That was globalization. Forty years earlier, my first trip in my later hosen to Rome, you could identify everyone by their nationality. You knew immediately from their glasses, their shoes, their haircut, their clothes, where they were from. Global, globalization has pretty much obliterated all of those differences. Globalization has certainly brought the demise of the later Hosen. thank God. <laughs> I was thinking of that when Pope Francis made his first papal visit to Lampedusa and threw a reef into the waters of the Mediterranean that had claimed the lives of so many thousands of migrants. It was then that Pope Francis coined that phrase, the globalization of indifference. What a powerful expression. We're all aware of so much suffering, so much injustice in our world, but Pope Francis wanted us to be aware of the fact that one of the underlying causes is our indifference. I've often thought of that phrase, globalization of indifference. What would be the opposite? What should be our ideal? How can we counter this indifference that paves the way for so much evil? I have reflected on this often, and it seems to me that there are two powerful antidotes. Gratitude and compassion. Two characteristics that I like to call Samaritan virtues. Let me share with you one of the most dramatic experiences of my whole life. On April the 1st, 1956, was Easter Sunday. I was 12 years old, and with my older brother Ted, we served the solemn high Latin mass in our parish. And that afternoon, we gathered as a family for a big meal at 2 o'clock. We ate a little earlier than usual that day because my dad was going on a business trip. An hour or so after he left, we received a call from the mayor of our town to tell us that my dad's flight, TWA Flight 400, had crashed and they did not know whether there were any survivors. It was a very frightening experience. I get emotional just thinking about it now. I worshiped my dad, and I was so distraught. But I'll never forget our, the first person to arrive at our house was Father Larry O'Connell, our pastor, who prayed with us, and he stayed with us until we received word that my father was safe. Most of the people on the plane, including the crew, had died. My father arrived home looking quite disheveled and with a big shiner like he'd been in a brawl or something. But he told us, quite luckily, he was sitting next to the wing. So when the plane went down, the wing was torn off and he was thrown out of the plane to safety. But he never really shared many details about the crash. A week later, the doorbell rang. It was a gentleman with his wife and his child who identified themselves as the Cohen family. They were the first Jews that I had ever met in my life. They brought flowers to give to my mother and explained that they were there because they wanted to thank my dad personally for saving their lives. My dad had not told us that 
when the plane crashed and he was thrown to safety, that he immediately went back to the plane and carried many injured pa passengers away from the burning plane. The impact of the crash caused all the seats to be torn up and thrown to the back of the plane, so the people were trapped by their seat belts and the seats of fellow passengers piled on top of them. It took the fire engines a half an hour to get there, and by that time, the plane was completely destroyed by fire, and most of the passengers died. After the Cohens left, my mother commented that Mr. Cohen was like the Samaritan, the gospel. And I piped up with my Catholic school education saying, no, Dad was the good Samaritan. And Mom said, yes, Dad was the good Samaritan, but Mr. Cohen was like that one leper, the Samaritan, who returned to say thanks. But the others, for whom your dad risked his life, never bothered to come to say thanks. My mother said, they must have been Irish Catholics. In today's world and in our own lives, I fear that the globalization of indifference manifests itself in a sense of entitlement. We take so much for granted, an attitude of, what have you done for me lately? Everything we are, everything that we have is a gift, but how quickly we lose sight of that. I was so delighted to see the enthusiastic response of our people at the Eucharistic Congress. Christ has made a gift of himself, the, the gift of the, just love taken to the excess. He manifests his love by making himself poor, small, accessible. So often we're looking for the gong show and our God reveals himself in the gentle breeze, and in a small piece of bread, and a sip of wine that have become his body and his blood, he strengthens us for our journey and our mission. And yet so often, this great gift is received with indifference. Our God forgives all of our sins. Our reaction at times is a yawn of indifference. To rejoice in God's mercy and forgiveness makes us ready and anxious to forgive those who've trespassed against us. And when we realize as Christ's disciples that he has saved our lives and without him our existence doesn't make sense, then we begin to overcome the indifference that blinds us to reality. It's in the Gospels, Jesus praises the foreigner, the Samaritan, who returns to give thanks. Then the Lord asks that embarrassing question, where are the other nine? I think I'm often in that company oblivious to the loving goodness with which our God surrounds us. You know, as a young priest in Washington, I used to wait every year for the Washington Post announcement of who won the, most, the prize for getting the most parking tickets during the year. And I always checked to see if I was a winner. But you know, it was always the same person the Russian ambassador. <laughs> of course, the diplomats didn't pay any fines, but that didn't stop Washington's fineness for giving them a parking ticket every chance they got. It was simply a silly manifestation of the Cold War. In Jesus' day, there was a Cold War between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The words good and Samaritan would never appear in the same sentence. And yet, one of the most beautiful parables that Jesus gives us in the gospel is precisely that parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I'm not a great scripture scholar like 
Cardinal Vallette and some of these other theologians here. But I'm of the opinion that Jesus probably based the characters in his parables on real people that he knew, people that he'd met. For instance, I like to connect the dots between the rich young man, an historical figure who appears in three of the, the Gospels, and one of the characters who appears later in a parable. The nameless rich young man goes to Jesus and he asks, what do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to get eternal life? He's asking the right questions. A lot of people live their whole lives without asking the right questions. He's asking the right person, Jesus, who better to answer our questions? Jesus tells him, obey the commandments. The rich young man said, oh, I've done that since I was a little kid. Jesus says, well, there's one thing lacking. You need to go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. All the gospel accounts, the three synoptic gospels of this historic encounter, tell us that the rich young man went away sad because he had so much money and he couldn't accept Jesus' invitation to give that money to the poor. I like to imagine that that rich young man who gave such importance to wealth may have been the inspiration for the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. The parable might simply be a description of what would happen to that young man in his later years. In the parable, the rich man, still nameless, lives sumptuously in great banquets and wears designer clothes while poor Lazarus is homeless and starving on his front porch. I suspect that the rich young man is now still sad and probably still congratulating himself for following all the commandments. But his sin is his gross indifference to Lazarus starving to death and covered with sores in front of his house. By the same token, I like to think that the Samaritan leper, the foreigner and historical figure, who was cured by Jesus and returns to give homage and thanks to the Lord, is the inspiration for the parable of the Good Shepherd, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan could very well be that cured Samaritan leper. And the Samaritan's reaction of compassion to the man left half dead by the side of the road might have been a result of his profound sense of gratitude for having been gratuitously cured by this Jewish stranger, Jesus of Nazareth. Pope Francis, in his powerful encyclical letter on solidarity and fraternity, Fratelli Tutti, points out that the Good Samaritan's love is not limited by cultural differences, nor does he use inconvenience as an excuse not to provide aid as the Levite and the priest do. Theirs is a reaction of indifference in the face of human suffering. The Samaritan does not expect any kind of reward for his generosity. His service is gratuitous and spontaneous. Indeed, the Samaritan is putting himself in harm's way since as a foreigner, someone could accuse him of being the one who attacked the man who was left half dead, a driving while black scenario. Pope Francis tells us the Samaritan is an example of the Christian calling to be a neighbor to all. The first step in overcoming the globalization of indifference has to begin in our own hearts. Like the leper Samaritan, we must learn to be thankful, to count our blessings, even the blessings in disguise. If we're going to be honest, very often success and prosperity 
tend to make us more self-centered and selfish. Sometimes it's those blessings in disguise, the crosses, the leprosy, the suffering that makes us depend entirely on God and thus discover his power and his love for us. During this supreme convention, we have the opportunity. Here we gather as brothers and sisters in a community of faith, and we see how blessed we are. The ideals and the goodness of blessed Michael McGivney, the fraternity and the joy of being part of Jesus' family, the witness of our fellow knights and their families should fill us with gratitude. Here we can discover anew that all that we are and all that we have is a gift from a loving God who loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to save us through his church, his bride. This profound sense of gratitude will necessarily lead us to be constantly seeking how to express this gratitude in acts of forgiveness, mercy, love, and service. I always like to tell the story about Cardinal Spellman, who one day was sitting in his office and he got a call on the intercom. It was the new receptionist in the lobby of the Chancery in New York. And the receptionist said in a whisper, Your Eminence, there's a man in the lobby. He says he's Jesus Christ. What should I do? The cardinal said, look busy. <laughs> the cardinal's glib response contains a great truth. That homeless office meds schizophrenic man is Jesus Christ in a distressing disguise, as Mother Teresa always said. In the parable of the Last Judgment in Matthew's Gospel, the divine shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The goats are the ones who saw the hungry, the homeless, the sick, the imprisoned, the strangers, and reacted with indifference. On the other hand, the grateful Samaritan leper is always reaching out with compassion and love, discovering in the man left half death on the side of the road a neighbor, a brother and sister. St. Francis of Assisi's conversion began when he overcame his repugnance for leprosy. Every time he would see a leper, he would hold his nose and run in the other direction. But one day, the grace of God touched his heart, and when he saw the leper, instead of running away, he ran towards the leper. He embraced him. He gave him his money, his clothes, and he kissed the leper. I always say that St. Francis of Assisi did not cure the leper. The leper cured St. Francis of his worldliness, of his fear, of his selfishness, and allowed him to discover Christ in a distressing disguise. The grateful Samaritan will never be indifferent, but always searching out to those in need. And just as we are thankful for our material blessings, our freedom, our homes, our health, so too we must be profoundly gratitude for the treasure hidden in the field that pearl of great price, the spiritual treasures that come to us from our life of faith, friendship with the Lord, and being part of his church. The parable of the Good Samaritan is given to us to explain who our neighbor is. Jesus is showing us that the one in need has the greatest claim on our love. And oftentimes, those needs are not just material, but sometimes they're spiritual. And hence, if we really love our neighbor, we want to share with them our greatest possession, our faith. Father Giussani once said, he who does not give God does not give enough. 
giving God is our mission. Pope Francis repeats over and over again that the church is not some sort of NGO geared toward meeting people's material needs. Our service to the poor and suffering finds its inspiration in our profound experience of God's love. Like the Samaritan leper, we have been loved, healed, forgiven. Our gratitude and the joy of the gospel can turn us into enthusiastic, compassionate missionary disciples. The story of the Good Samaritan is the only parable that ends with a very explicit command, go and do likewise. From the Samaritan virtue of gratitude, we come to learn the Samaritan virtue of kindness, a virtue that is disappearing in today's polarized world. Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti gives us this beautiful description of kindness. He says, kindness frees us from the cruelty that at time infects our human relationships, from the anxiety that prevents us from thinking of others, from the frantic flurry of activity that forgets that others also have a right to be happy. Often nowadays, the Holy Father says, we find neither the time or the energy to stop and to be kind to others, to say, excuse me, pardon me, thank you. Yet every now and then, miraculously, a kind person appears and is willing to set everything aside in order to show interest, to give the gift of a smile, to speak a word of encouragement, to listen amid general indifference. If we make a daily effort to do exactly this, we can create a healthy social atmosphere in which misunderstandings can be overcome and conflict forestalled. Kindness ought to be cultivated. It's not a superficial bourgeois virtue, precisely because it entails esteem and respect for others. Once kindness becomes a culture within society, it transforms lifestyles, relationships, in the ways that ideas are discussed and compared. Kindness facilitates the quest for consensus. It opens new paths where hostility and conflict would burn all bridges. Kindness is certainly part of Pope Francis' call to synodality. As spiritual progeny, of Blessed Michael McGivney, let us strive to break the globalization of indifference, to repair our world, to become grateful Samaritans who spread the compassion and the joy of the gospel, and hopefully we won't have to wear later hosen to do it. God bless you. Viva Jesus. Thank you very much, Your Eminence, for that powerful message to us on kindness. As we come to the end of this wonderful evening, I now turn to our Supreme Chaplain to close our evening with a benediction. Your Excellency. And dear friends, as indeed we bring this joyous state's dinner to its conclusion, let us raise our minds and our hearts to God in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We give you thanks, O Father, for gathering us together, knights and family members and friends of the order, hailing as we do from near and far. Though we live in many places, Lord, we live, in, we live as one, bound together as we are, in the communion of the church and by the gospel principles of charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism. This evening, Lord, we have experienced yet again the joy of our fraternity, 
We have renewed friendships. We have encouraged one another. We have been inspired by those who spoke to us and by the example of those we honor. As we go forth, we ask for the grace always to be on mission, not our own mission, but the mission of the Knights of Columbus, a mission entirely at the service of the church's mission of evangelization, a mission that is animated by a charity that evangelizes. May the heart of your Son, O Father, speak to our hearts so that we in turn can speak credibly words of spirit and life as we bear witness to your Son, the Word made flesh. In that hour, when your Son and our Redeemer gave his life to save us, he entrusted Mary, his mother, to us as our spiritual mother. Just as she gave you thanks and praise and praise for the great things you did for her, so too, Father, we, your knights and families, praise and thank you, echoing as we do Mary's song of praise. For indeed, our order is dedicated to Mary under the title of Our Lady of Guadalupe. In saluting her, May we honor you, O God, the giver of every good gift and the lover of our souls. And so we lift our voices now in song as we sing, Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vital Dulcedo, et spes nostra salve. Ante clamamos, exules filiae, a te suspiramos, gementes et flentes, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, Ilos tuvos misericordes oculos ad nos converte. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui nobis post hoc exilium ostende. Oh, claim. Oh, pia. Oh, 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 be oh, 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 May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Vivat Jesus. Thank you, Archbishop Laurie. And to all of you, thank you for joining us this evening. Good night. Bon nuit. our coverage of the state's dinner here at the Supreme Convention in Quebec. I'm talking with Jonathan Reyes. Jonathan, a few closing thoughts on today. This has been a long day, I know, for all of the participants here. You know, I think the Supreme Knight put it best. Jesus is alive, he's real, and he's still changing hearts. I think it was just so, such an encouraging day that the Lord is active and moving, and what a privilege it is to have spent the day with the Knights and to just think of all the things the Lord is doing and to make our our journey part of that. Yeah. Perfect summation, I think. And I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to have been able to spend the day with you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, it's been great spending the day with you. 
Well, we hope that you've enjoyed our coverage here of the 142nd uh, Supreme Convention uh, for today of the Knights of Columbus. Remember to tune in tomorrow for the morning mass here from Quebec. For all of us here in Quebec broadcasting, as well as everyone in Birmingham, thank you so much for sharing in our journey with you. I'm Matthew Bunsen on behalf of Jonathan Reyes. Remember, for more information about the Knights, please go to kfc.org, and we always ask people to go to ewtn.com. Until tomorrow, please take care and God bless.